You are listening to The Real Faith Stories Podcast, interviews with people who chose to boldly follow their faith. I'm your host, Brian Robinson. Now, let's meet our guests and hear their story. Terry, welcome to Real Faith Stories. Really looking forward to you sharing what God has done in your life. Thank you so much, Brian. It's wonderful to be here today. We had a chance to connect prior to this conversation and talk about how the Lord led you pretty dramatically in a shift in your life with respect to ministry into moving to Africa. And that was no small thing. Uh And now that you're there, what God has been doing literally Tens of thousands of people coming to Christ verifiably, and they're also getting discipled, and they're also being used to help others get discipled. Not only that, but what you've experienced with respect to the power of prayer changing nations and people to the point of witch doctors getting set free. Yes, that's correct. Let's back up a moment here, and I'd love for you to share some of your backstory, where you grew up, how you came to faith, and then that moment where God led you into selling it all and moving. Thank you so much, Brian. I grew up in Canada, and my father was a a missionary in northern Canada amongst the First Nations people. And a little after that, he immigrated south and became a pastor, mainly because of education for us children. But that's the environment I grew up in. I've known Jesus since I was a little girl and always felt called into ministry since I was a young teenager. I went to Bible college, became a a pastor, and my focus was missions always. And so I was a missions pastor for many years, about 20 years, and had been in out of Africa more times than what I can count on my fingers, as well as other nations. But Africa stole my heart at a very uh, young age. But I used to always say, Brian, I'll go and stay a month, but I'll not live in Africa. That was where I was at. And then a crossroads in my life happened a few years back. And uh, I didn't know what God had next for me. I thought perhaps because of some situations that had happened in my life that maybe ministry was over for me. But one day God spoke to me very clearly. I was sitting in a conference. I'll never forget it. It's one of those moments where not an audible voice, but it was loud and clear. And he said to me, you're going to run till you're done. It's not over. And so I didn't know what that meant, but it was very clear. And so I was just praying. And about a year later, I was driving on my way to Florida. And I reminded the Lord, I said, Lord, you said I was going to run till I'm done. It's not over. And so what does that mean? What's next? And within one week, I was sitting in front of Carol Ward, who is the founder and international director of Favor International. A mutual friend had introduced us and said, Carol Ward is in town. I'm sick. Will you take her to church this morning? And I said, sure. So I met her, took her to church. And during church, she said, let's have a coffee. And so we had a coffee and she started telling me all about Favor International. And it was like a business conversation. It wasn't about Africa. It was the back end of the ministry, the fundraising, the administration, and some of the challenges. And about 45 minutes in, I kind of interrupted her. But let me say this first. You know, it was one of those conversations where you could feel the Holy Spirit brooding. Mm. You're in the conversation, but you're in your heart, you're saying, Holy Spirit, what's this all about? Yeah. Because you could feel his presence brooding, although it was like a business conversation. And so about 45 minutes into the conversation, I, I said, excuse me, Carol, why are you telling me all of this stuff? And she said to me, because you're going to join favor. <laughs> ah, I immediately, I knew it was God. I knew it was the Holy Spirit. And I said, yes. And with, within a week, I was traveling with her through the U.S. She was doing a bit of an itineration with partners and new donors and stuff like that within the U.S. About six weeks into that trip, we ended up in Oklahoma, <laughs> where you are. Yeah. And it was to do a retreat with uh, a, a group of people that were potentially going to form a U.S. team because this ministry had been growing so rapidly 
that we had to do something on the U.S. side to facilitate what God was doing on the field. We were there about two days, and in the middle of the night, the Holy Spirit woke me up. And God woke me up two o'clock in the morning, just like that. And once again, I heard his voice, and he asked me a question. He said, will you go? And I was quick to say yes, because I had been many times I was thinking short term. But then he said to me, will you stay? And that caused me to think a little bit deeper and a little bit harder. And needless to say, I tossed and turned that night. I, I didn't answer him. I tossed and turned and my mind was racing a million miles a minute. And I finally went back to sleep the next night, two o'clock in the morning, wide awake, same still small voice, will you go? And I said, yes. And he said, will you stay? And it was at that point I said to him, I'm having this conversation in my spirit with the Lord. I had just bought a brand new car. I said, what about my car? I had bought a little place in Florida. I was going to do the snowbird thing back and forth. said, what about the house? And he said, give it all away. Wow. And I said, okay, then what about the kids, which is the big one? What about my children? What about the grandchildren? And his voice said to me, don't you think I can look after them much better than you? And of course he can. Of course, Lord, of course you can. And so it was more or less you talk to Carol and see what I'm going to do. And so I didn't know her that well. I'd been traveling with her about six weeks. So I went to her and I said, God's been talking to me in the night. And more or less, when I told her what he had been saying to me, she just said, yes, this is an answer to 18 years of my prayers. You're going to Africa with me. And I proceeded to get ready. I gave away my car. I gave away that basically sold and gave them money for the house away and literally emptied everything out of my bank account, except for enough for a one-way ticket to Uganda. And that's how it all started, Brian. It was just, it was like that little song I was singing this morning where you say, I'll say yes, yes, Lord, I'll say yes to your will and to your way. And I can tell you that Every need has been supplied exceedingly abundantly above more than I could ask or even imagine. As you share this, I'm just thinking of somebody listening to this testimony right now. Sell everything. Give it all away. God will take care of you. Yes. Tell me, when you made that decision after the Lord woke you up at 2 a.m., two mornings in a row, what was it that came through your mind when you ultimately said, I'll do it? It wasn't a question in the beginning. When I said yes to the Lord and basically presented to Carol and she said, yes, this is what God wants, there was no question in my mind at that point in time. But in the weeks of preparation, as I started to prepare and I gave away my car, sold my house, it was, God, are you sure? Mm -hmm. Are you sure this is what you want me to do? And sometimes the flesh comes in, but he was faithful every time to give me a confirmation. And I could go back, the details are many. But I could go back and show you a time after time after time where he confirmed his word to my heart that by the time I left, there was no, no doubt. And there hasn't been any doubt ever since. And he's been faithful. Uh, he's been faithful to provide. Just before I was about to step on the plane, an unknown person gave me a sum of money that became like the widow's oil that never run, ran out for the first two years I was in Uganda. You know, you look at things like that, and you know, what God has said, he will do. His promises are true. And if he speaks it, that's what he'll do. So you were getting on the plane to go to Uganda and someone hands you some money. It was like two days before. Close enough. Yeah, close enough. It was somebody who did not know my name, but they had heard that I was going. I'll just say it, it was $10,000 and it was in my account before I stepped on the plane. And that's what sustained me for two years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, Terry. That's amazing. So how would you encourage somebody at this moment who's thinking, wow, okay, this is someone going to Africa, but what about me in the United States and God is nudging me to take this step of faith to do fill in the blank, whatever. Uh -huh. How would you counsel them to press into that and to surrender? Well, I guess it comes around to what we want to talk about before the podcast is over is prayer. It's about seeking the face of Father. And the more that we seek the Father's face, and not just His hand, but we seek His face, the more deposits that we get dropped into our spirit. It's through the Word, and it's through seeking His face. And of course, every one of us 
has a plan that's designed by God specifically for us. And so for others, it's not to go to Africa, or it may not be to go to Africa, but it may be to do something in your community or in your city or even with your family. But one thing that I do know, and I share this everywhere I go, is that as long as we have breath in these bodies, it's for us to house His Holy Spirit and for us to house Jesus. And so we have to be His hands extended. There's always something for us to do to be the arms and the feet of Jesus into the world that we're in and where He's placed us. He's purposely positioned us in the place that we're in to fulfill His promises on earth. Yes. I've heard that statement many times, seek his face, not his hand. Right. Could you dive into that a little deeper? And what does that look like to seek his face in prayer? Well, it's spending time with him and developing the intimacy that oftentimes we lack in prayer. It's easy to go to prayer and now I lay me down to sleep, or, you know, God is great, God is good, bless this food. But when we develop an intimacy with him, just like the Song of Solomon, where we're that Shulamite woman that is pursuing her lover, and as we pursue the face of Jesus in intimacy, he reveals to us the secrets of the Father's heart. He never intended us to not know his heart, but it comes through intimacy. And that's built on relationship. As you said, that only happens through time spent with another. That's right. When you got to Uganda, you hit the ground running. That's right. (laughs) And explain, please, how prayer was integrated in the whole DNA of this ministry and what God has been doing. So favor was birthed in prayer. Our founder, Carol Ward, went to Uganda 22 years ago. And to make a very long story short, she ended up in northern Uganda during the war. It was the LRA war, and people can Google it with Joseph Kony, which was a horrific, horrendous war. Everybody was evacuating, and some reports say next to the Holocaust, it was one of the greatest atrocities Mm. on the face of this earth. So it was a bloody battle up there. People were just dying left, right, and center. Joseph Kony was a man that believed he was Jesus Christ empowered by Lucifer. So he was evilly turned against his own people. And so Carol went to northern Uganda during this war. The UN said, don't go. The embassy said, don't go. But she went and they said to her, you'll come back in a body bag. And she just went to pray. So Favor was founded 22 years ago. She rented a little room, put out a cardboard sign that said House of Prayer. And people started to come to pray. And that's all they did. They prayed. And about six months to eight months after she was up there, she had a national prayer gathering, which we do to this day. We rent a stadium, which is basically a field, and people come for 77 hours, 11 hours a day for seven days to pray for the nation. And that's what she did way back in 2004. And a thousand people showed up to pray. Let me pause there just for context. She feels led of the Lord to go to Uganda. She literally gets a little place, puts a cardboard sign out saying house of prayer. That's how she starts. Very humble and obedient. And then in six months, she decides we're going to have a a national gathering, as it were, for prayer. That's right. And a thousand people show up after six months. Yes. She made flyers and the group of people that had started praying with her in the house, they just started passing out flyers to everybody and anybody. And a thousand people showed up to pray. They came through bullets, stepping over dead bodies, but they were desperate. (sighs) And five days into that national prayer gathering, some of the city officials called her and said, are you the crazy white woman that's praying at the stadium? And she said, yes, why? And these are unbelievers. They said, because it's like a curtain has rolled back over the north and the atmosphere has changed. Now, can I tell you that within three weeks, the war stopped? Amazing. Yes. And so you can attribute it to circumstances or you can attribute it to prayer. Yeah. Whatever. But who does that? Only God. The evil dictator abdicated and he went into the jungles of Congo and word came back to Carol. This is another whole long story. But he told his nephew 
that it was during that exact week that he lost his powers. It's overwhelming to hear this, and it's so encouraging at the same time how powerful God will use us when we pray. Yes, those national prayer gatherings continue annually to this day. As a matter of fact, as I'm talking to you, there's one going on right now in South Sudan. And so every year we have a week where we gather people from all across the nation to pray for their nation. So after this first gathering, now, of course, it's been years since 04. Yes. What has been going on? What's been happening? Then I'd like you to share with me what's happened this year, which is mind-blowing. Yes. So let me fast forward then. Now, 20 years later, we have 820 indigenous missionaries. We don't hire North Americans or Europeans. We empower and train the local, the national people to run the ministry. And so there are 820, and they are passionate about the harvest. And I was telling you, Brian, that this year alone, from January to the end of our third quarter, we're still working on our annual, that'll come out in a couple more weeks, but to the end of our third quarter, which was the end of September, we saw 75,840 people come to Jesus, recorded salvations Mm. with three months discipleship. So it's not mass crusades where you're counting hands. It's people's names written down on paper, and they've been discipled in small groups for three months. And at the end of that discipleship, they get a completion certificate and a Bible if they're literate. That's incredible. Yeah. 75,000 plus in three quarters of the year. Yes. Wow. I know you've got so many stories about how God has set people free. One of those you shared was when you just hopped in a Jeep and drove into a village and you had to preach. Yes, let me tell you that story. There's many. Before I tell that story, what I would like to qualify to is what we're seeing this year in particular is Muslims coming to Jesus. And that is happening because there's a war in Sudan that started in April and hundreds of thousands of refugees are fleeing from Sudan into South Sudan. So we also have offices up in South Sudan. And so our missionaries on the ground there went immediately to the refugees. And we're seeing thousands of Muslims turn to Jesus, become water baptized with discipleship. So God is doing incredible things amongst the Islamic. Some of them are regimes, some of them are Muslim by birth. But we're very excited about what God is doing. And and our rural discipleship has gone into eight countries to the north of Uganda including South Sudan, Sudan, Chad, Ethiopia, Congo, and and so on. Tell us that story. Okay. So this happened in June of this year. We had a visiting team from America, and I wanted to take them to one of the most rural, underdeveloped regions of Uganda, and it's the northeast corner. The area is called Karamoja. They're warring tribes. They're nomadic they're cattle keepers. They all have AK-47s. The government trades guns for cattle and that type of thing. But Favor is trying to put a footprint for Jesus in that land because we believe that even though it's like what good can come out of Nazareth, that's the way that area is looked at. We know that Jesus can change that whole region and that one day even the president of Uganda will say what happened in Karamoja. So I took the team out there and we set up a a medical clinic, a mobile medical clinic. And uh, our guys have been doing these rural evangelism in that area for about a year. So while the American team were doing the mobile clinic, one of our guys said to me, let's go to a a new village. We just started. They don't know about Jesus, unreached people group. And uh, I said, sure. So we jumped in the truck and we headed that way after the clinic was set up. They were well on their way doing their thing and we headed out of town. We were about 20 minutes out of town and we had a local with us to give us directions. And the local said, "Uh, I need to relieve myself. And so I said, okay. We were in the middle of a very busy area. There was about a thousand people, markets selling tomatoes on the side of the road. And I was confused why he wanted to stop right there. But he jumped out, he did his business, got back in the car. We drove about 100 yards and it was it was like desert again. There was no people. I was a little bit confused and I said to the young guy, I said, why did you get out back there? Why not here where there's no people? 
And he said to me, no, 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 mom. After that market, you don't get out of the vehicle. So I went kind of quiet and I was thinking about his comment. And then I said to him, why don't you get out of the vehicle? And he said, because this is the most killingest road in Karamoja. This is where the tribes fight. This is where there's bloodshed. So you don't get out of the car. So I said, okay, we won't get out of the car. No problem. So we continued to drive and and, and it was windy roads. They send people to guide you where to turn and so on. And after some time, we got to this very small village. We drove through a it was like a laneway with thorn walls and we got in there and there was about 200 people and the men were dressed with blankets, holding spears or sticks and waiting for us to arrive. Unreached people group. Now our guy, his name is Herbert. He had been on the ground there since Monday and now it was Wednesday. So I knew that they didn't know too much about the gospel. And the chief greeted me. They're happy to have visitors. He said to me, our warriors are going into the bush today to have peace talks with four other tribes. This is with an interpreter, by the way, four other tribes, because we're tired of fighting. And so I said, yes, that's a good thing. And so there was about 200 people. They were sitting under mango trees and they had a little bench. And as I was sitting down, Brian, it dawned on me, you're going to have to preach to these people. And I honestly hadn't thought about it because it had been busy with the American team at the clinic and running here and there. And so you do one of those, I call it a 911 prayer to heaven. I said, God, these precious people, what am I going to say to them? They don't know you. They probably don't know the name of Jesus or don't know very much. Our guy had only been there since Monday. And I said, what do I say? And so he dropped a little thought into my heart in that instant when I needed to hear from him. And so when I was introduced, sure enough, I get up and they wanted to hear from me. And so I got up and I took my cell phone and I turned on the flashlight on my cell phone and I pointed it at them. And I said, and this is with an interpreter, after I did all of the pleasantries and the greetings and the cultural things, I said, if it was dark, there was no sun, no moon, no stars, no light anywhere. I said, which is more powerful, the darkness or the light? And I had my flashlight pointing right at them. And they put up their hands and they said, the light. And I said to them, of course, it's the light. And I said, God, who created all of us, who created this world, who created you, the animals and everything, loved you so much. He had only one son, but he wanted to send his son to be the light of the world. And that was the segue that God dropped into my heart to segue into the gospel and to explain how Jesus came. And then I talked to them about the whole gospel message, Jesus dying on the cross. And then I ended with, our hearts are all dark. We're all born with dark hearts through tribal war, through fighting, through killing, through stealing. Our hearts are all dark, every one of us, mine included. But when we invite Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the light of the world, to come into our hearts, it takes away the darkness and his light lives inside of us. And I asked them, Brian, how many of you would like to invite Jesus, the light of the world, to come into your life? And every single one of them put up their hand <laughs> that day. And so I said to our guy, lead them in the salvation prayer. And he did. They all accepted Jesus. And to make a long story short, I have to end with this. The chief stood up and he said, this message that the lady told us, we're going to take it to the four tribes in the bush. And he said, will you bless our land? And I said, let me do that right now. So I stood up and put my arm around the chief and I prayed for that barren dry land that the desert would bloom again and God would bring forth yield from that land as they have invited the light of the world to come into their hearts, that he would also heal the land and bring forth fruit from the land. They went off into the bush. I gathered the U.S. team from the medical clinic. We all headed to our separate places. The very next day, Our guy, Herbert, on the ground, called our leader in town, and he says, you're not going to believe what happened. He said, those warriors came home that night, and the windows of heaven opened, and it began to pour rain, and it rained all night on a land that had not had rain for months and months and months. Mm. It poured rain. And I could only say, 
Who does that? Yeah. When you present God, he shows up and he shows off. And it's nothing to do with us, but it's a supernatural intervention of a loving God who loves those precious people so much that he would show himself strong. That chief said to our guy on the ground, the message that we were given was true because God has blessed our land with rain. We want to give a plot of land to favor to build us a church. It's overwhelming to hear that story. For God to give you that download, right when you needed it, of course, yes. to say what you said, for him to ask you to bless the land. Yes. I mean, none of that stuff was happenstance, obviously. Yes. And that's what I love about our God, the intimacy of every moment with everyone. Isn't that mind-blowing? It is mind-blowing, Brian. And as I'm telling that story, there's a dozen more in my head of what God has done. And it is all through prayer. We call weeks of fasting and prayer, actually, at the beginning of every quarter. I don't know if you heard, I think it was around March or April of this year, Ebola broke out again in Uganda. It was in the west side. And Ebola spreads rapidly and is very dangerous. And we called our team. We're canceling work. We're hitting the floor on our faces a week of fasting and prayer. And we did that. And at the end of that week, Ebola was arrested. Mm. It left Uganda. It never came to the north. It never spread. It was contained by the Holy Spirit. And so those types of things are happening on the field all the time. What would you say to somebody here, of course, in the United States, as we're recording this, who is listening to this saying, oh, if only I could experience that in my world, in my orbit, what would you say to somebody who has that heart? I would guess you'd probably say, just spend time with him. Yes, absolutely. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God in Africa as he is in America. The key is prayer. I firmly believe that the strongest weapon that God has given to us, the body of Christ, is prayer. And the enemy does everything he can to bind up prayer in our lives. And whether it's distractions on the phone, social media, whatever the distractions are, that's what the enemy tries to bind because he knows that that's our strongest weapon. And so God absolutely acts supernaturally in America, and the key is prayer. And if we would seek his face and humble ourselves and turn from our ways, then he'll heal our land here in America. He wants to, and he wants to use us to do it. And if you want to add an atomic bomb to your praying, then fast. That's like adding an atomic bomb to your prayer. And when you start to fast and pray, you'll see the hand of God move in ways that you can never, ever even imagine. I agree. I've seen it. It's the last thing we want to do is deny ourselves. But God honors that mightily, doesn't he? He sure does. This is something that arises in my mind. When we talk about prayer is you hear about people praying 11 hours, right? Right. After like two minutes, people say, I don't have anything else to say. How do you pray for hours? You pray the word. You pray the word. When you're praying scripture, you're praying the perfect will of God. So you pray with the word and you start in something as simple as Psalm 23. We all know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I thank you, Lord. You're my shepherd. I shall not want. And then list the things that you want and that you need and pray the word just in the 23rd Psalm as you start to pray through the word of God. And what we do when we have 11 hours prayer or, or extended fasting and prayer is we'll pray maybe for an hour, and then we worship for 20 or 30 minutes, and then we pray for another hour. So if anybody's doing that type of thing within their church or, you know, a home group, you break it with worship because worship is also communing with the Father. But we pray the Word, and we don't let our guys pray on and on and on for 20 minutes of meaningless, you know, thoughts that are coming randomly into their head. We tell them, you pray the Word, and then you sit down, and the next person gets up, you pray the Word. And as you're doing that, scriptures come to your mind, and the Holy Spirit wants to partner with us, and He's on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is our prayer partner. So we partner with the Holy Spirit, and we pray the will of the Father through the Word. As you're sharing that, I'm thinking of the scripture that God's Word is like a hammer that shatters a rock. Amen. Let's go. Yes, 
We didn't get to touch on the witch doctor getting saved and a separate story about the Iman getting saved. We can save that for another episode. How about that? Wonderful. How can people find out more about you, Terry, and the ministry? You can find the ministry on our website. It's Favor, F-A-V-O-R, International, the short form, I-N-T-L dot org. So it's Favor, I-N-T-L dot org. And as far as me, you're welcome to email me. And it's the same, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at Favor, I-N-T-L dot org. Great. As we finish here, Terry, would love to have you pray for our listeners, please. Yes. Father, we thank you that you're a God of abundance. You're a God of provision. You're a God who desires to work through the lives and the hearts of your people. And I thank you for everyone that is listening today. And I just pray that something would stir in their spirits, that you, Holy Spirit, would breathe on the embers of their heart into a full-blown, passionate flame to enter into deeper prayer and to see your kingdom come on this earth, in their communities, in their churches, in their cities, and yes, this nation. And Father, we know that you desire to partner with us. And so my prayer for the people listening today is that they would say yes to you in a deeper way and go deeper into prayer and see what you'll do through their lives. Let them be challenged today because you want to do it and help them to be willing. Help us all to be willing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Terry, thank you so much. I look forward to hopefully having you back again. Thank you, Brian. It's been my honor to be here, and thank you for having me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the show and share this with someone you believe would be encouraged and motivated by these stories. Until next time, I'm Brian Robinson reminding you that the greatest decision you could ever make is to ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Thanks again for listening.